Good morning, Covenant Church. Great to see you. So that I don't forget, I want to wish you a Merry Christmas as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't want to forget to wish that to you. And hey, uh, we ought to be excited. Man, we are celebrating the hope for all humanity Christmas, aren't we? You know, I mean, I, I'm honored to be able to share today a uh, uh, message with you. But, you know, I know at Christmas messages, you're not supposed to preach fire and brimstone and all that kind of good stuff. But I'm telling you, when I think about what Jesus did for me, I can get a little fired up. When I think about what he did for my family, I can get a little fired up. When I think about what, how he's changed my life and who I was and who I am today, I can get a little bit excited about what this day represents. Can you get excited as well? Man, it's a great, great day. But we don't celebrate it just one day. We celebrate our life with him. Amen? That's what it's about. And so I heard a song, something about being naughty and nice. So if you like amen me a whole lot today, then maybe you're nice. If you're not, you're naughty and you get nothing for Christmas. So I'm just, come on, let's go. Let me, let me, uh, let me greet you on behalf of um, uh, Pastor Amy. Uh, and she uh, was a little under the weather. And uh, so she couldn't be here, but she sends her season, season greetings. And you know, I don't know about you, but I'm sick about people being sick. Come on, let's pray about that. Father, I pray you touch your people and keep them healthy, Father. Keep them from the flu. Keep them from all the, the allergies, all the stuff that goes around, Father. Keep them healthy and strong with their families and just touch them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I have to make a disclaimer. Josh, stand up a minute. I want you to know, Josh hosted, we did not call each other today and say, hey, what are you wearing, Josh? Hey, what, not, you know, like girls do all the time. Hey, what beautiful shoes you have. You know, we didn't do any of that. I just want you to know. But see, we're in sync with the Holy Spirit. So he just told me what to wear and him to wear. And you're looking good, Josh. You wear it much better than I wear it. I'm just telling you. But listen, uh, last week, Pastor Amy brought a tremendous word. What a great message using the, the nativity scene about Jesus being the central part. Everybody surrounded him. But, but remember, if you, if you take him out, move him to the back, uh, and you focus on, you know, Joseph and Mary, which was relationship or, or, or whatever there, that he's not center, then trouble begins. And so the question was, is he the center of your life? You see, far too often... Far too often, we expect too much from people, and far too often, we expect too little from God. See, is he central in your life? That was the question last week. And so this week, we're going to extend that a little bit, and I'm going to ask you the question, and we're going to jump into what the wise men uh, did there in, in Matthew. We'll read a little bit from there, but I'm going to ask you the question, is he your king? Last week, we asked, is he central in your life? And the question I asked this week, is he your king? You see, he came as a baby, but he also came as a king. And that's the real question. Is he your king? See, the wise men came, and they were searching for the king. And they asked the question, where is my king? And they, wanted, they traveled a long way, and, 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 and they carried gifts with them. And we're going to talk a little bit about what those gifts were. And, 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 but they traveled a long way to get there because they were in search of a king. And, and can I just tell you, I'll give a subtitle if, if I can to you, and that's this, wise men still seek him. Okay, I can drop the mic, I can walk off because if you walk away with that thought right there and you do what the wise men, and they kept searching for a king. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about Jesus coming into this world. And, you know, can you imagine he was a baby, and, and that day that he was born, do you know that the day that Jesus was born, he fulfilled some 367 prophecies of the Old Testament that he would be born? Can you imagine the stress that was on him? Could you imagine the expectation that people had of him? Because he's fulfilling what they said about him and what he would be. In fact, I shared this last week uh, in, in my hosting time. But think about this in Isaiah 9, 6, where, where Isaiah prophesied this. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And it says this. And the government will be upon his shoulders. Let's stop right there. I mean, he hadn't even been born yet. He's just coming. He's been prophesied. And the entire weight of the world is on his shoulders. And all humanity is depending on that. Can you imagine that pressure? 
Can you imagine? But God equipped him to be able to handle that pressure, to be able to handle those expectations. You know, when you accept him as your Lord and Savior and recognize who he is, you're equipped to handle the pressures that come your way. You see, the world is going to put pressures on him. They put them on him. And the Jewish people, it's interesting, they were, they were very scholarly people and they were very uh, religious people and committed to that. But they were saying, we need a king, but they missed the whole point. So many of them missed the whole point. See, they were looking for a king that would deliver them from the tyrannical government of the Romans. And they thought, oh, we're rejoicing, we have a king. They missed the whole point that he came to deliver them. Not from a Roman government. He came to deliver their life. He came because they needed salvation. And they needed freedom. They were looking for the wrong kind of freedom that only could be found in the freedom in Jesus Christ in their life. They needed a Savior. Now, here's the beauty of this, and we relate it to us. We all know he was born in Bethlehem, and it said, you know, it was in Nazareth. And the Bible says that, that the people said, no good thing can come out of Nazareth. And so they, they just didn't expect much of those people. Oh, well, if they're from Nazareth, they're not very smart. Well, if they're from Nazareth, they're, that's the poor side. That's the wrong side of the track. That's, that's the bad. And, but God chose one of the lowest places to bring Jesus into this world, which is the greatest answer for all humanity. And so what does that say to us? Let me ask you a question. What kind of expectations have been placed on you? Whose expectations are you living up to? Are you trying to live up to? What kind of pressures are you facing in today? You know, before we're yet born, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with this, with parents are, they've already got college funds going. They, they, they've already got your plans. Oh, you're going to be a CEO. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be this. And if God calls you that, that's all great. I talked to a young lady this morning and said, man, the gift that God's given me, I'm going to be a pediatrician. Hey, that's wonderful. But they put expectations on you right away. Or, man, you're going to be a superstar athlete, so I'm going to take you to every sporting event. Nothing wrong with those things, but sometimes the expectations are too great that come in our life and the pressures and the stress that comes in. Or maybe someone has given you a negative expectation. Like, oh, well, listen, they're, they're, you know, they ain't going to amount to much. We don't expect much of them. I mean, uh, uh, their, their father was an alcoholic. They're going to be an alcoholic. You know, they're, they're, their father, he was a loser. So they, they, they don't amount to much. And we don't expect much. And maybe people gave you a negative expectation that you're not going to amount to anything. And, 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 and then what we do is we start looking around. And we start looking around us and comparing. And, well, I'd like to be like, wish I could be like that person. Or, or, or gosh, I, I wish I could have that kind of car. And we begin to compare the gifts that we have and what God's put in our hands to everybody else. And then we look at this thing called uh, Facebook, which, by the way, it's just all fake most of the time on there. Right? <laughs> hey, they're just giving you the, the world they want you to think. And we begin to pray, well, I don't have that. I can't do that. And we start to live our life based on looking around at the wrong places. But what we really only need to do is compare to what God says about us and what, who he says we are. In fact, in, in Psalms 139, this is what he says you are. He says, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Did you know that's what God said? He goes, I, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You don't have to worry about what anybody else thinks about you. What does God say about you? And then he goes on to say, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought. See, God's already skillfully put gifts in you to be used for not only your life, but for his kingdom. He's already created you that way. You go, well, I don't know. I talked to another person. Man, I, 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 I give my life to God, but I don't know what, what, what God has in front of me. Listen, God's already got it planned. He said it right here. He said, you, it's verse 16, he said, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days are fashioned for me. He's already gifted you with what you need to be all you need to be. You don't need to look at other people. You don't need to look around at other things. I'm going to say it again. You see, wise men seek him. So you see, we compare. Here's the good news. Jesus, because Jesus, he came out of Nazareth, no good thing. But because Jesus is in you, great things can come out of you no matter what anybody says. 
See, that's good news. It's good news. He's given you gifts. And things can come out of you that can bless those around you and build the kingdom of God. You see, sometimes we look at God and, and we think, we expect, okay, God, you just do it all. You just, just, just get, give it to me and do it all. I want to be blessed and do all that. And God wants to bless you, but he expects you to do your part. What are you doing to prepare your gifts? What are you doing to develop? I talked to that young lady, as I said, and, and she's in, at University of Houston, and, and she said, well, I'm studying this, and I'm going to be a pediatrician. I said, listen, when God's put that gift in you, he's given you a mind, you submit that to him, and you're going to succeed and be one of the best doctors ever when you prepare the gift he's given you. But, but, but listen, we try to expect sometimes God to do it all. He expects us. Here's what you can expect of God, though. See, the Bible encourages that those that trust in him can expect good things. Psalm 62, 5 says this, my soul waits silently for God alone. My expectation is from him. Here's what you can expect from God. One, unchanging love. See, his love never changes. Doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, how bad you think you are, or how far you've got away, his love doesn't change. Last service, I talked to a gentleman who came up and he goes, thank you for sharing that word. And with, with tears in his eyes, he said, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a felon. I was a convicted felon. I'm out of there. And you know what? I thought I was too far from God's love. Listen, it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done. When you turn your heart to him, he loves you either way. His love is unchangeable. His love is unconditional. His love is sacrificial. And the beauty of it is love is redeemed, uh, redempt, uh, redemptive. That's why he sent Jesus to redeem you back to himself. You see, you can expect unchangeable love with God. Two, you can expect unending presence. He said this, with God, you will never be left out. How, how many know what FOMO is? See, I'm an old dude, but I know what FOMO is, what they talk about. It means fear of missing out. Can I tell you, when you place your life in God, you don't have to have a fear of missing out on anything. God said, I am with you always, wherever you go, no matter how far you go, how deep you go, I am with you. You can, you can know and expect that you have an unending presence when you're with God. And number three, you have an unending life. Listen, don't be short-sighted. This life here is but for a vapor. But he said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. And so guess what? Because Jesus came that day, you can have life and have it abundant right here on earth and then in heaven for the rest of our lives. Why? Because he came to that. You can expect unending life from him. So here we have the story of them saying, where's my king? So in Matthew 2, 1 through 12, it says this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? See, he said king of the Jews. Jesus never called himself king of the Jews. In fact, when they called him that, he says, You say that of me. See, they, they, they kind of missed the point. The king of the Jews. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. I, I, I asked the question, why did they see the star and no one else may not have seen that? Because wise men still seek him. So when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where was the Christ uh, was to be born. You see, Herod was troubled because Herod was not of the lineage of Jacob. He was of the lineage of Esau. He was not a born uh, Jew. And so he really was in error to be there and by, almost by default. And so he was kind of shook up and worried about who is this king of the Jews going to come over and overthrow me. He's going to take my throne. So he wanted to co uh, concoct a plan to see what happens. So, so they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of, of, of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, see he's concocting a little plan here, determined 
uh, from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. That's a lie. We know he was setting it up so he could go get him there and kill him because he has a threat against him. And so, he, you know, Jesus is just born. Now at this point, when the wise men get there, it's about two years old maybe. Uh, something like that, because it said he was at the house. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star, which they had seen in the east, went before them. Wise men still seek him. Till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasuries... They presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country. So I'm going to share a couple thoughts about that here, and then we'll finish. I want you to understand, you know, there was a real commotion when they came, and there was really stuff stirred up because Herod was afraid. And so he said, go get him, and he concocted a plan uh, to get him. But you see, God spoke to them in a dream. And see, when you're still seeking him, he will speak to you. He will direct you. He will tell you where you need to go, when you need to be there. Because he, he said, hey, come back to me. He said, no way, Jose. I'm out. I'm going to my own country. You see, God can speak to you when you're seeking him. So I want you to understand, the wise men brought gifts. Every gift the wise men brought declared the deity of Christ. It declared him as a king. Now, I know there's discussion about, well, the goal was there for their, for their trip, and it was. It's for Joseph and Mary to go to Egypt and get away. We get that, and the, and the health benefits of myrrh and all of that. But it's even more, it's even deeper than that. You see, gold was symbolic of Christ's deity as a king. See, gold was only given to kings, and, it was, and, and the, 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 the thing about the gold is that it was pure. It had gone through the fire. It had gone through the test. It was pure. And it was only for So it spoke of his deity because when you think about the tabernacle where the priests would go in, then the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant was uh, made of acacia wood, which represented the humanity of Christ. But yet it was overlaid with gold, which represented the kingship of who he was. You see, that gold pointed directly to the fact that this is the king. You don't have to search any farther. He's right here for all humanity. And then when you think about the frankincense, the frankincense that, uh, that was there would also be in the Holy of Holies at the Ark of the Covenant, and it would burn, and smoke would go up, and it, it billowed. And the smoke was like the prayers of the priest. And so, and so it went to the, to, to the nostrils of God. The Bible says a sweet aroma into him. You see, so the very frankincense they gave there was representative of Jesus' priesthood, that he is the priest. And then the myrrh. It's interesting on the myrrh. It's a myrrh is a resin, and it didn't have any really distinct odor, but in order for it to release its properties, it had to be pressed, and it had to be crushed in order to release its property foretelling that Jesus would be pressed and that Jesus would be crushed. And they used myrrh for the burial, and so it foretold of his burial coming, and then they also blessed the prophets. So what am I saying? When they brought the gifts, it wasn't by accident that it was gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It was a distinct message to the world. This is your prophet. This is your priest. This is your king. You don't have to search anymore for where he is. He is right here in front of you, and that's what the wise men were looking for. Can I just tell you, he's he is your king. He was your kid, king. He is your king, and he will be your king. Amen. Because he was, he is, and he always will be. Yes. See, he's the king you're looking for. As a baby, they, they may not even known the full impact of what they were bringing. But you see, in a practical sense, they also brought the gold for Joseph and Mary because God spoke to them divinely in a dream and said, take him and go to Egypt. And they had to travel, so he was practical. But what does that speak to me? 
That speaks to me that when you make him your king of your life, he knows everything you need exactly when you need it, right at the time that you need it to provide anything you need in your life. See, when he's the center of your life, when, when he's your king, everything that you need is already provided. And can I tell you this? When you accept him as your Lord and Savior, he's your prophet to speak to God on behalf of you. You know that? Listen, he said, I'm at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you all the time. Listen, he's praying for you. He's your priest. He's, your, he's praying for you. He's going to speak words of encouragement to you. He's going to speak words of divine direction to you. He's going to guide your life as the prophet in your life. He's going to go to God. And see, here's the beauty of it. He's at the right hand of the Father, and he's in you. And, and when God looks down, he's got to look through him first. And all he can see is the blood of Jesus. He doesn't see who you are because Jesus says, hey, I've already covered them in my blood. You see? Can I tell you, you too, when you accept Jesus, this holiday Christmas, so much more than just sharing presents with one another. So much more than just family. I love family. I got two grandchildren now. I, I love hanging with them. I'm looking forward to all that. But this thing is about Revelation calls the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You don't have to search for your king anymore. The question is, is he your king? Is he has already gifted you with everything you need? He already knows you. I read what the word said. Before you were yet in your mama's womb, he knew your name. He said, I fashioned your days for you. You don't have to search me anymore. Just accept me. I'm your king. I'm your Lord. I'm your Savior. Just accept me. You see, he's already gifting you. So my question is, what do you do? You see, you got to prepare your gifts. The wise men took them two years to get there. I'm sure they went through a lot of rough terrain. I'm sure it was difficult at times, but they protected those gifts because they wanted to give them to the king. I don't know what's going on in your life and what, what you do or, or things you're facing, but he's gifted you for everything you need. He's just waiting to submit those gifts to him. He says, I can touch those gifts now. No matter what you're on, turn those gifts to him. Prepare your gifts. And then let me say this. What's your perception? You see, we can look all around and start comparing to all these people next to us or, 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 or that person said this or I'm trying to live up to that boss's expectation and we all have things we have to do. I get that. But we start looking around everywhere else. But don't, don't miss this. The wise men looked up. They looked, they looked up. You see, God doesn't need your gift. God needs nothing. God doesn't need your gift. Your gift needs God. You see, and the, and the wise men, they looked up. Why didn't anybody else look up? Because they were more interested in what Herod had to say. They were more fearful of what man had to say. And see, can I tell you, if you, you get anything out of this message, can I tell you this? Wise men still seek him. Wise men still listen to him. Wise men still obey him. And he's provided everything you need. You see, when you prepare your gift and you change your perception, I teach in marriage all the time. We get all these problems in marriage, you know, money and family and all kinds of different things. And what we do in marriage is we face off with each other. We start coming from our own perspective, our own perception, and we face off. But what we really ought to be doing together is face up. God, what do you say about this? God, what would you have me to do? God, I submit this to you. You see, you don't have to search for your king. He's here. We know who he is. And can I tell you, he'll provide everything you need in your life 
whenever you need it at the time you need it. I'm going to tell you a story as I close. About three months ago, my son had a, had a dog. This is a dog story, and you think, you know, but you know how dogs become part of your family, like a child. Well, my, my son had gone through a tough time in his life, and he had this dog from a baby and grew up, and it really, it honestly got him through a lot of tough stuff. It was like his friend. Well, one Tuesday night, I was here on this campus. I was actually training with our Renew leaders, and we're having a training, which I'm never here on a Tuesday night, you know, like that. I was here at about 9 o'clock at night, and we got done, and uh, one of my elders uh, came to us and said, and said, hey, can we talk to you a little bit? And so we stood out in this parking lot to about 11.15 at night, just visiting, praying about some things, talking about some things. I would never be out at 11.15 on a Tuesday night over here, you know, we'd be home by that time. I'm just telling you how much God cares about you. He knows exactly where you're at, and he knows exactly what you need, exactly when you need it. So I'm driving along, Charlotte was driving ahead of me in her car. I get a call 11.30 at night from my son. Very unusual. Oh, what's Drew calling? I was actually on the phone with Charlotte. I said, what's Drew calling about? And I said, let me take this. Well, I pick it up. I can barely understand him. He's weeping. Hey, Drew, what's wrong? What's going on? What happened? What happened? I thought something. He was, Dad, he finally got, Dad, Dad, Bruno, that's his dog's name. Bruno died. I said, oh, Drew, I'm so sorry. What happened? He goes, I don't know. He just said, he died. I said, oh, okay, listen, Drew, I happen to be out. I said, I'm out. Let me come to your house. He lives over here in Lowry Crossing. He said, no, no, Dad. He goes, I'm, I'm at the animal hospital. He's weeping. I said, where's it at? I'll come. He said, at 121 in Custard. And I looked up. At 1130 at night, I was at 121 in Custard. I said, Drew, I'm exiting on Custard right now. I'll be there in one minute. Called Charles, she came. You see, God knew he needed me right when he needed me, right at that time. That's how much he cares about you. And my son and I talked about it. He says, Dad, God, he says, Dad, I can't believe, really, how much God cares about everything. He sent his son, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you have authority over anything in your life. No matter, see, a King of kings means he's got supreme authority, and you do too, over anything you're facing. Would you stand to your feet with me? I hope you got the gist of the fact that wise men still seek him, wise men still listen to him, and wise men still obey. Now I want to ask you a question. Have you made him the center of your life yet? Have, is he your king over your life? He's just waiting for you. Maybe you came today and this is Christmas season and you're thinking, oh, well, it's all great, but you know what? What a greater time to say, I'm ready to make him, to make him the king of my life. We're going to pray a prayer in just a minute, but how many of you in here, before we pray, that say, you know what? There's some things in my life I need him to rule over and be king just in my life. I haven't quite given it to him. Just raise your hand. Yeah, several. Give it to him now. He's your king. He's your king. But I want to ask you a question with every head bowed and every eye closed. Today's your day to say, you know what, Bob? I'm not going to wait any longer. Christmas season, I, I'm ready to, to make him the Lord of my life. I'm ready to make him my savior. I'm ready to make him my king. And we're going to pray a prayer together. And before we do just I'm going to look across the crowd and say, today's my day, Bob. This Christmas season, I'm giving it all to him right now. Just slip your hand up. And, and, and back down. Yes, thank you. Come on, who else in here? Yes, thank you. Come on. I'm looking across here. Yes, thank you. Come on, anybody. Today's the day. He's King of King and Lord, Lord of my life. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Come on, let's pray. Let's all pray this together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you sent your son on that Christmas morning so that he could be my Lord and my King. I believe in my heart that Jesus came, He died on the cross, 
three days later, you raised him from the dead to give me life. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. And I ask you to be Lord of my life, be king of my heart. And I can boldly say, Jesus, you are Lord. And today, I am saved. Amen. Listen, we're going to worship and then be dismissed, but I want to bless you for, to have a wonderful Christmas. But can I encourage you, put Jesus in the center of it all and let him be the king of your life, and you'll see the blessing that comes with that. Amen? Come on, let's finish with worship.